enough of that. Welcome back to this week's Yawa. As you can see, we have more people sitting with us. Laura and Tyler, our friends, uh, dog aficionados, and German short hair experts of Kansas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Very expertise. Yep. Today, we're going to do something just a little bit different. We're actually going to have the pros versus the average Joes. Wow. We maybe, got average. Maybe I, below average. I just but... didn't get mediocre. <laughs> Uh, you guys know the drill. You ask us questions, and we try our best to answer them. And what we thought would be fun this week is to add a non-professional perspective, um, something that may give us maybe a little more light even into the meaning behind your questions or things that we didn't think about, and we get to hear them here. So without further ado, Kat is going to uh, read the questions because I'm not any good at it. Again, we had a ton of really awesome questions that it was hard to pick just a few for this uh, video series. So if we didn't get to your question, you can reach out to us on Patreon or ask it again next week. But keep in mind, too, some of these questions have been asked in the past on previous Yawa. So go ahead and check them out in our playlists, as well as if you want to see some more great videos, make sure you're subscribing. Subscribe. It's down here somewhere. Okay. Now, getting on to our first question from Instagram, Rachel J. Pug, and if I mispronounce these, I'm so sorry, but... Pew. Pew. See, this is why Laura's here already. Uh, suggestions for first night home with puppy. Best sleep recommendations if they are crying. We are planning on a crate, of course, but want her to be as comfortable and not scared as possible. Our GSP will get to come home May 2nd or 3rd. Yay, that's exciting. So thankful for all of your training videos. Looking forward to utilizing it all. So what would you guys have to say about tips for the first night home with your puppy? We've had three first night homes, and the first night's the easiest night uh, because they're still tired from when you pick them up uh, wherever they came from. Uh, the second night, however, is what I'd say is the true first night. Um, and we're a lot of trial and error, uh, of course, the average Joes. But um, all three of our dogs have been different. Uh, our first dog is crazy, um, like <laughs> clinically so. And our second dog, uh, he, uh, we could listen. You, you knew the difference between his cry when he needed to go outside. Um, it was more of a whimper. And you, you kind of got him as soon as we heard that. It was almost every couple of hours. Uh, and then um, the third dog was also kind of crazy, um, and he did not sleep hardly at all. So uh, we keep them in our room uh, closer to us, and then we already had two dogs when we had the third puppy at home, and that helped a little bit with comfort level. Uh, they had a blanket in the in the crate, but we usually tried to make sure, has it been two hours? They probably need to go outside, take them out, put them right back in. Yeah, uh, I can't really add much to that. That's a pretty good answer. And just if you, <laughs> yeah, what she said, what what she she said. Big, big contributor over here. And you say you want to use a crate, which is great. And I think that it's important to mention that if that's your plan, you got to start that at day one, night one. They're sweet. They're cute little puppies. It would be great to just cuddle and snuggle them in bed, but that's what you're setting them up for then. Then that becomes their expectation and the default. And then going from that situation to a crate gets harder. Yeah. A lot that's going to make it not, a lot yeah. more not difficult. Just a no, little it harder, does. exponentially yeah. harder. Yeah. We made mistakes with our first clinically crazy dog. And um, in the sense that she would whine or she'd cry and we would go react and talk to her and try to reassure her and lay by the kennel. I mean, you know, all like crazy dog owner type things. And that just made her cry more because then we were responding to what she wanted and getting the attention. And we always kept her in a crate. So we never, we never gave in and put her in our bed. But... Um, we kept her in the crate, but then we would go talk to her. Fortunately, we started obedience classes before we found Kat and Ethan. And the trainer we used there, she was pretty knowledgeable about that and told us to knock it off. So well, we, we did. We quickly did. did. Yeah. That's um, a really, really, really awesome point that you made there, uh, which was an initial mis mistake, basically, that you made with training. And it's one that lots of people do. You know, you apply human behaviors and thought processes and everything to the process and you go well if I was alone I would want to be comforted and in fact when they get the attention that they need then they feel that that is the norm or that's what they need in order to go forward from there so it does set up for more issues in the future rather than actually fixing which is what you're trying to do yes 
So next question from wit.bray on Instagram. Is it a bad idea to bring a puppy home at six weeks if the breeder gives it as an option? Or should we wait for the full eight weeks? It's so hard to wait patiently, especially during quarantine. Um, you want to start this time? Well, I know uh, taking them away from your their mother at an earlier age, you're going to have some issues with anxiety and stuff. Crate training probably down the road. I know we brought our first one home when it was seven weeks, I think. I think so. And that might have contributed to her being a little bit crazy. She she was one of the first litter pups out of 13 that went home. Oh, wow. That's a huge yeah. litter. Yeah, it was a big litter. And uh, that also, I mean, being the first one by herself could uh, bring out issues as well. And they had never separated the puppies. Uh, they had always been together and they'd always been with mom the whole time. So I think, you know, the, the extra two weeks from six weeks to eight weeks, I mean, you guys do a lot with that time with crate training. And I, I mean... Of course, it depends on who you're getting your dog from and what they're doing, but I think it it's actually huge. Developmentally, we've seen a difference between the dogs we've brought home at eight weeks versus her at six or seven. I would agree with you. Yes, I can understand that you're impatient to get your new puppy, and puppies are sweet and cute, and you just want to get them home, but if you can leave them till the eight-week mark uh, to continue socializing with their litter mates and continue socialization at your breeders, I know for... How we work with the puppies, we are working on crate training typically from six to eight weeks. Uh, the puppies aren't necessarily by themselves. They're with a litter mate, but they're broken up and not to have all of their litter mates all the time. And that litter mate switches up every once in a while. Um, and then we do other socialization things as well. And I know that socialization right now with new puppies has been a little bit difficult for people because of social distancing and quarantine. So once you get that puppy home, it's up to you then from that point on to continue their socialization. And it may be more, may be more difficult right now. Um, but we that's why we send our puppies home at eight weeks as well as it's a state law for us to not send them home any sooner than that. So that's also something you might want to check out. Um, I know that, that varies from state to state, but we have to keep our puppies until they're eight weeks old um, for to follow the law. Absolutely. The, the biggest thing is I think there's a lot of, and it's been touched on, but the specific things, there's a lot of development that happens in that time period and pulling them from the litter early, um, which that, is early. There's uh, some guys that wrote a long time ago that 49 days was, was, was some magical number. I don't personally believe that that is the case. Um, Just like there's also been some articles written about puppies staying weeks. with their litter mates and their mother until 12 yeah. weeks. And Which I don't believe with. The, I also the, don't think that that's ideal. Moms are typically like done, done with their puppies between five and six weeks. At least our moms, they're like, okay, you guys are turning into a pack of wolves and a little bit of this piranha action is happening. Uh -huh. um, and our dogs as well have really great temperaments. So they're not going to necessarily snap at their puppies and tell them no and put them in their place, which is what we want. We don't want them to do that. We don't want them to try and um, snap at their puppies for sure. But then you've got to herd of puppies that are just pestering the heck out of mom. And she's like, what do I do? I can't get away from this. And if you're forcing her to be with them till 12 weeks, I think that that could actually cause um, some other developmental issues, as well as those puppies starting to bond more securely with each other than moving out to their new forever families and creating that bond with their people. Absolutely. Great question. Yes. Next question from Dan O. Callaghan. I believe this one's from Facebook. Help. I have a 10-week-old female lab having a hard time getting her socialized with other dogs because of the virus. Nobody wants to let them play together. Any suggestions? Well, this was a perfect segue from what we were just talking about, and I didn't even, I didn't even plan it. I'm just that good. Um, so. <laughs> nice. I'll uh, also add Thank a little you. bit Pat there for you. Pat me on the you. back. <laughs> Thanks there, honey. Um, but we were just talking about socializing and how it can be difficult right now especially. But um, you guys live in town. We live kind of not in town. So do you guys have any suggestions? I think you were mentioning that your guys' dog parks are still actually open. Yeah, and we actually have a dog park in our neighborhood, um, and I'm sure our neighborhood breaks all of the rules for the virus. But, um, you know, we have neighbors with dogs um, who have been, they're outside. Uh, you know, they've got kids getting stir crazy. So they have dogs outside. Our dogs um, are three and almost five. 
And so they, they all play together. So that's one way. Uh, 10 weeks is still early, but living in town, um, our first dog when she was on her own and we just needed her to have no energy when we got home from work, we actually took her to daycare starting around 16 weeks. So you're still too early for that. But uh, that's a good way as well to get them socialized because our doggy daycare uh, would send us kind of a report home if she had done something uh, that's not socially acceptable with the other dogs. But we do uh, dog parks quite a bit, and then now we have two, so we cheat a little bit. But um, that's what I would suggest is if you're in town or you're in a neighborhood and you've got any neighbors with dogs, you don't necessarily have to get close to the neighbors, but if the dogs can just be in the yard together, that's another yeah. idea. and I think that that's a been a misconception with the virus is that the dogs can be transferring it right. from each other and then to people and that's that's definitely not the case uh, I have no fear that I'm going to be getting the coronavirus from any of our dogs or any of our client dogs that are coming in for training that's not going to happen um, the only small potential could be like contact you know s- someone sneezes but you're going to get just as big a chance from getting it from the box from the delivery guy yeah. or you know whatever right. I mean, the store. dog itself isn't, isn't a carrier the virus, of no. the virus, no, no. correct. Right. And you're probably not the only person you know that have a dog. Reach out to somebody uh, and do kind yeah. of more of a one-on-one type deal. Yeah, springtime's so, puppy time. Yeah. Everybody's got a puppy. Um, we get tons of puppy questions. So maybe finding a forum or a neighborhood. I know you guys have a neighborhood Facebook group um, that you could reach out to. Even some of these dog training communities like Navda, sometimes they'll be able to connect you with somebody else that has a puppy. And also just to keep in mind, socialization is not just interacting with other dogs and other puppies and other kids. There's a lot that goes into that socialization 100%. from just going for free runs out in the tall, thick grass yeah. that they can start getting accustomed to the new environments and sensations. Yep. Um, so it doesn't just have to be interaction with people and dogs. So if you're still struggling with that, you can continue socialization by car rides, uh, Hopefully you still got another vet appointment coming up at 12 weeks and 16 weeks, which that's all good socialization. See, I would say that even um, our personal dogs, everybody talks about socialization and gets worried about the things you just mentioned, but our personal dogs that are we're raising, developing, don't end up getting to go meet a bunch of other people's dogs or they don't go to those environments. We have dogs here, so they get to interact with those. That isn't even what you're considering, you know, the, the, they don't really go to dogs outside of our pack, if you will, um, typically till they're fully vaccinated, which is going to be 16 weeks on. Yep. And we don't put them in situations where, um, you know, dog parks or other dog uh, areas that are highly populated with dog stuff, like dog parks on the side of the road, or even just when we travel, if I stop at a, a gas station and I can see a bunch of dog poop in the grass, like, oh, this is where all the people let their dogs out. That's not where my puppies yeah. go to the bathroom right. until they're fully vaccinated so that we can help prevent them from getting sick. So that's a good point. Yeah. Where you're at now is not really something that I would be worrying about with lacking in socialization because you should be doing other things, just like experiencing the world, if you will which is still acceptable in most areas, as long as you're not doing it around other people, being outside is completely okay. So um, that would be more what we'd be looking at is some of the other things that they're going to be exposed to, some small amounts of travel, even if it's just around the block, getting used to being in the car, and then to some kind of grassy area. I know that's harder in big, big cities, but some area that they can go and romp and play a little bit. Yep, so good question especially very relevant with what's going on in the world today. Uh, Next question from Sherry Brannon on Instagram. When do you begin teaching your puppy how to walk on a leash and do you have a video? Why, yes. (laughs) Yes, Sherry, we do have a video. Probably multiple of them on our YouTube channel, so definitely check that out. Um, But I think this is a really good question because I think you're going to get a little bit of a different answer from the pros and the average Joes over here. And that's not necessarily because... You guys are the average Joes, but it's more because of where they live. They live in town. There's leash laws, things like that, whereas we live in the country, and we don't necessarily have those leash laws. So why don't you talk to us a little bit about your leash training with your puppies? It's actually kind of funny just because Denzel recently. Right. Uh, Like you said, being in town, I mean, the first thing you want to do is take them on a walk in the neighborhood, and the first thing they want to do is pull you throughout the neighborhood. Or sit down or not. 
or, or chew on their or, knees. Yeah, or yeah, yeah, play tug of war with it or whatever. So, um, you know, early on, just keeping them going is pretty hard, but just encouraging them to move and to walk on that leash. At right. First. It helped having other dogs that were walking well, ahead of them. But yeah, and what I did with Denzel is I just I had a treat that kind of lured him to keep forward walking. to go forward and. Um, I didn't necessarily give him that treat uh, until you know he he'd gone far enough. Yes, <laughs> and he continued moving. Care. And it only took five minutes, I no, think. Yeah. And um, the next time it was okay. I don't want the leash. I'm going to bite it, but we're going to walk. So um, it was very quick progression, and we had to you know put him on a leash. I remember sending uh, them a video of this puppy. I think we'd had him two or three days, and it had been a nice day in January that we went outside. We were laughing because he just sat down. And they said, well, to be fair, you know, we haven't introduced the leash. I said, well, we don't have an option because yeah. if we want to go on a walk, he has to be yes. on the leash. So until we can get to a field, we could let him run. But um, that's what I did is I used a treat to lure him forward. And then we had the two other dogs and he walked with them and saw kind of what was supposed to be and done. So how long did it take for him to go from the needing some encouragement to... Now it's like, whoa, Nelly, hold on. I'd say five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I'd say five minutes. And and that's, I'm sure you guys can add more to this, but we uh, didn't encourage him to walk nicely. You know, he didn't walk by us. We let him pull as much as he wanted. For one, he weighed uh, 12 pounds at one point. But, you know, he's not pulling our arm off. So we weren't encouraging the stay close to us, but we still had to keep him contained so he didn't run in the street or get loose, and then we'd get a ticket. So Exactly, and that's... Also, what I was going to say, so when we talk about healing and putting emphasis on those leash manners, we always say we want to wait until we're seeing a bold, confidence, and independent search in the field because we're creating most of the dogs to be hunting dogs. We're training hunting dogs. Now, if you don't have a hunting dog, and we always try and mention that, hey, this isn't always about hunting dog questions, um, and you've got another breed that's not necessarily going to need to be bold, confident, and independent searchingly in a field, then you can always start that healing work sooner. Um, but we usually say five to six months old is a good start to actually expect healing behaviors. That's a point usually when they're getting strong enough and big enough that that pulling is yeah. wearing your arm out and you're like, okay, we need to come up with a solution here. Well, that's the age they probably have the mental capacity to actually heal and heal for longer periods of time be focused enough yeah yep absolutely i have nothing to add <laughs> we could just like cut the video off here no just, yeah. kidding. <laughs> just kidding next question <laughs> from joshua allen 2015 from instagram what is your personal opinion on gsps with doc tails have you ever owned a gsp without a doc tail in addition, do you currently dock the tails of puppies in your breeding program? I have something to add here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Go for it. Raise your hand. Um, first of all, uh, tail docking is something that comes up a lot, even a lot more more recently in the fact that I believe it's been banned in a few countries because it's, I don't and know, quote, unquote. And there's talk of banning it in some states. In the United States, yeah, the, which yes. is absolutely ridiculous. Um, and... The reason for the docking is if you don't dock the tail, you can see what a short hair's tail would look like, and they are long like a giant whip. And Yeah, you can look at what an English pointer's tail looks like typically. I mean, it's going to be very similar. It is, but even most short hair's tails are longer. Okay. Which is... Which we don't get an opportunity to, to see, see all that often. Them, no, but same, same kind of concept. You've got a long, skinny tail with a short hair over the top of it, so minimal coverage, and... You have a dog that's designed to run through cover and hunt and even more dangerous, I believe, than the cover and the hunting and that aspect of it is the corners within your In own house. house. And it's probably become a little bit more concerning lately because these dogs are becoming more, more family dogs. Family companions, yeah. Yes. So you end up having this dog that has this long tail and then you take the personality of any kind of versatile hunting breed that's excited, it's happy, it's upbeat, and that tail is always wagging, 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 wagging. And they whipping beat it. Whipping more like. Whipping, yeah. They beat it on everything. And then all of a sudden, now you have a tail that has a cut on it. And then that cut hits everything. And then it, your and house then the starts to look like. And everywhere. Yeah, it starts to look like a murder scene. And it can, as soon as it happens, I mean, it takes months and months and months to heal. You have to come up with some fancy kind of covering for the tip of their tail. And. That uh, they're 
typically going to chew off anyway. It, it can be very it's difficult tough. to keep yeah. that covered so that it can heal. And then the second it heals and you go, oh, that looks great. Then whop, they hit it on something again and it's that new skin. It breaks open again. So um, the, there's multiple facets that build into that that make it truly beneficial for their tail to be docked. Um, our dog's tails in our program are docked. It's currently the GSPCA's breed standard to dock at approximately 40%. Um, so we do it and we do it for multiple reasons. The, the next thing, even with English pointers, um, there's a lot of those guys that started taking even just an eighth of the tail, you know, like uh, 10% off so that they could knock that small whippy portion down just a little bit and still remain the more full tail look like a, the standard of the English and American pointers. But all of that for the same reason because it gets beat to snot and um, you can't take care of it. So. Well, and just to talk a little bit about the tails that get continuously beat up and are constantly breaking back open and can't heal, they can actually get so bad that they have to be amputated. And yes. basically you're docking their tail then at a year, two Which years. Which is insanely more. It's a much bigger procedure. Um, and you've got much bigger bone and joints and things like that at that point to do when there's anesthesia involved. And anytime you put a dog under anesthesia, there's always a risk yep. um, that they're not going to wake back up. So doing this procedure that could have been prevented by docking the tail of the puppy at three to five days old, which is a very minor procedure, which we actually um, do by banding their tails. Mm -hmm. And then the tail actually shrivels up and falls off in about five days maximum, um, and it heals really nicely and is really pretty easy on those puppies. Um, yeah, they're, they're completely healed in a few days. Yeah, and you know you're looking I mean? at putting a little puppy through that to prevent, you know, a lifetime of problems with that tail whipping and hitting and breaking open and potentially getting such a bad infection or so traumatized that it ends up having to be Well, you look at other breeds that do on. have long tails and, continue, and, and they maintain that long tail. Like um, any of the labs, yep, they've got heavy coats that cover and protect Much the tail. Much more protective. Most pointy-eared breeds have heavier, thicker coats like uh, shepherds or... Malinois. Malinois. Um, any of those kind of things, but that short coat and whippy tail and a happy butt, I mean, it's just recipe for disaster. Yes, but um, you also asked if we do that for ourselves in our breeding program, and I kind of touched on that a little bit, that yes, we do, and we do it with a process... Um, of banding and actually we just had a litter of puppies our muddy benny litter i'm yeah. super excited for them and we plan on filming an entire puppy i don't know development video series of vlog style and that's going to be part of one of the videos is tail day tails and claws day so Absolutely. be on the lookout for that video and make sure you're subscribing so you don't miss those cool videos all right, guys, that's all we've got for part one of this week. Uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I'm the guy with the pink gun. I'm Cat the Dog Trainer. I'm just Laura. And we're just Average Joe's. Tyler. He's actually Tyler. You're Tyler. He's not average Joe. Tyler. <laughs> hey, thanks, guys, and we'll be back with you shortly.